We're going to turn to the word of the Lord this morning, and I'll be, I'm not going to continue with the um, message, with the message series, uh, How We Grow, that we took, that we, I think the last time was in May sometime, it was, and, and uh, so I'm not going to continue with that because this is, if you will, sort of a, a one-off um, message not really a one-off message, but you know what I mean. Uh, I will be away two Sundays after this Sunday. Uh, Mom and Dad asked if I could come back to the U.S. for a little while, and so I said yes. Um, and uh, so I'll be away two Sundays. So we're looking at uh, a different, a slightly different topic this morning that the Lord put on my heart. And then when I get back, we will be, uh, we'll be turning, going back to how you grow again. But this is what I'd like us to look at this morning. Living the life you were called to live, living the life you were called to live. And it is found, uh, this, this, the thought for this is in Philippians chapter 3, and the verse comes, uh, let's go, sorry, go back just a minute, stay, stay with this just a minute. Um, the, the, the central thought in Philippians 3.12 is what Paul says, and this is what we're looking at, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And as we think about that, I have some questions for you this morning, questions for myself as well. And this is more of a, uh, we're going to be going pretty quickly, we're not going to take a long time. Sometimes, you know, I get a little bit, I'll slow down on things and spend a long time on a few points, but I do want us to, we'll go sort of all the way through, and maybe we'll come back to this later. But the question for, for each one of us, the thing for us, each one of us to think about this morning this morning is living the life we were called to live and we get a glimpse of that when Paul says I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me we know this passage so well and it's found in a larger passage and now we can look at the larger passage it begins um, in verse 10 <clears throat> And I'm not going to read all of this verse, but this is, as it begins in verse 10, Paul gives his goal, his life goal. Do you have a life goal? Do you? You should. You say, well, uh, I hope to do well and love people and I hope people love me. And now, come on, that's a little pitiful, right? Um, that's a little bit wimpy. But I love what we see of Paul. Paul, in verse 10, says, here's his life goal. He says, I want to know Christ. And then he goes on, in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's verses 10 and 11 that I've not included here. So this is the first part. Here is his, here's a life goal. And then I want us to look at the passage that comes after that. Because what we just read, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus to took hold of me, is found in this whole passage. So I, let's look at this. And he says, let's look at the whole passage together. And there's more, but we're, we're going to get to it a little bit later. He says, not that I have already obtained all of this. And you say, what do you mean? What has he not yet obtained? That was verse 10 and 11. His goal, the goal of his life. I want to know Christ. How many of you know Christ this morning? Yes or no? Yes? yes? Raise your hand. Hmm. Well, I have a question. Here's Paul who surely if somebody knew Christ, Paul knew Christ. Yes? And yet he says, in effect, his life goal is, I want to know Christ. Well, Paul, if anybody knew Christ, you knew Christ. If anyone knows Christ, you know Christ. In fact, as we know from his other readings, he was taken, although he's so humble about it, at one point he was taken to heaven either in the body or by vision. He was given a glimpse of heaven and he saw Christ and he saw heaven. Surely, Paul would say, I know Christ. And yet, here he has in this strong passage, and this is when he's written, he's in prison, he's already been a Christian many years, he's been serving the, he's been serving the Lord. You might say Philippians was written perhaps sort of in the middle of Paul's life, probably around that time if you were to say. He says, I want to know Christ, and then he says in verse 12, but I haven't obtained, a, a, t obtained it yet, and I've not been made perfect. Now all of us would say, oh, me either, I've not been made perfect. Perfect here means complete, fully complete, 
okay, fully complete, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And that's, the, that's our key verse this morning. That's our key expression this morning. And then you can read the rest of it. We know this so well. He says, I don't consider that I've taken hold of it, but these are the things that I do. And I want us to think about this just a minute. And I want us to think about Paul. Not all of us have a, uh, have a salvation that's as dramatic as Paul's, do we? Walking on the road, not just walking, with purpose. On the road, for, he was going from Jerusalem to Damascus, and he was going to get all of those, all of those, those cult members, those people who said they followed Christ and were trusting in Christ rather than trusting in the law for righteousness. And Paul thought that was just, that's the worst thing that could ever happen to God. And he was going to defend God's honor. He's on the road to Damascus to take people prisoners, to hand them over to death, to all sorts of death. And on the road to Damascus, a light shines from heaven. We know this part of the story. A light shines from heaven. He falls to the ground. He is blind. And he hears a voice from heaven. Apparently, other people hear a sound, but they don't hear the voice clearly. That's what we can understand. And Jesus himself speaks to Paul. Now, how many of us would say, yes, my salvation was that dramatic? Mine was not. But I know some of you have had a very dramatic salvation. I know if you haven't talked to Sister Bridget before about hers, ask her about it sometime. And Pastor Renee has shared with, with, with us at times how, how instantaneous and how, how, how great it was. And some of the rest of us have, as well have had a very great salvation. And I want us to think for just a minute as we think about living the life we were called to live. So are we living that life? I want us to think about Paul just a minute because Paul understood what this meant. He said, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. When did Christ Jesus take hold of Paul? When? On the road to Damascus, right? Now, he was following him before, before then. I think he was trying to deal with, with, with Saul before then. I think Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, was already dealing with Saul when Saul was present at the uh, martyrdom of Stephen, wasn't he? When they were throwing the rocks, right? Don't you think so? That's a, such a beautiful picture that we have. You say beautiful? Yes, a beautiful picture of the martyrdom of Saul and the love of God and the power of God, Saul, of Stephen and the love of, of God and the power of God and the forgiveness of God and the faith of God and the boldness of God just flowing out of Stephen. That had to speak to Saul's heart, although nobody knew it, right? And so Jesus was chasing him before then. And you know what? All of us, Jesus has been chasing us before we've ever come to him. He really has been. Amen. It's true. And sometimes I want to encourage you. You look at other people and you think, they're so far from God. They're so far from God. Let me tell you, if anybody had looked at Saul, what would they have said? So far from God, right? So, so far from God. We don't know what Jesus is doing behind the scenes. But on that road to Damascus, wow, on that road to Damascus, he grabbed hold of, of, of Saul, a little bit like a, a bulldog. If you, I, I, that's kind of what I think of in this passage. And you say, well, that's kind of, that's kind of disrespectful to speak of Jesus that way. Don't, don't think about it in that way. But the tenacity and the firm grip and the determination and the I'm not going to let go of this one when Jesus grabbed hold of Saul in such a fashion, grabbed hold of him like a bulldog or like something that, that grabs on and is not going to let go. And Saul felt it. And Saul felt it. And here we have this expression. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. When Christ Jesus grabbed Saul and saved Saul, he had a very clear purpose in mind. He had very clear goals in mind. He had, I am grabbing him for these purposes. Here's the great thing. Paul, at that moment and in the days and the weeks and the months and the years that followed, also understood why Christ Jesus had grabbed hold of him. God always knows what he's doing, doesn't he? Do we always know what God's doing? No, a lot of times we don't. But it would help us in our Christian walk and it would strengthen us as we walk day by day and go by day, day by day in a very uncertain world if we 
had an idea and a glimpse and an understanding of why Christ Jesus has grabbed hold of us. Because I want to tell you something. Saul, Paul, is not the only one that Christ Jesus has taken hold of. He's not. Are you a child of God this morning as you sit here? Yes? Then guess what? Christ Jesus has taken hold of you too. He has taken hold of you too. You say, well, I don't understand it and I don't really feel it and I'm not like Saul. Then maybe there are things that we can do, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning, to understand the hold of Christ Jesus on our lives and the purposes that he has for us. And Paul, Paul understood. That's why I think Paul's life was so productive and so steadfast. He understood why Christ Jesus had, had taken hold of him. You know, when I first went to China, and I've given you my test, part of that testimony, testimony before, so I don't want to go into a lot of detail about that anymore, because I want to talk about other people this morning. In that particular area, I knew why Christ Jesus had taken hold of me in that, in that time when I went, in, went to China. And I've told you about that before. Understanding Christ's hold on me, for His purposes on me for that time, is the only, 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 only thing that kept me in China in those days when it was so hard. It was the only thing. And when you and I understand why Christ has grabbed hold of us, and He's pulled us out of darkness, and He's cleaned us up, and he has taken us out of dead end relationships that were destroying us, although we didn't see it. He's taken us out of situations that would have ended in our spiritual destruction and some of us in our physical destruction as well. And he saved us out of that. He brought us out of that. He saved us from ourselves sometimes. Sometimes our worst enemies are not those people out there that are against us. Sometimes we are our own worst enemy, aren't we, without Jesus? We are. We are proud. We're full of, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And Christ Jesus grabs hold of us for His purposes and He saves us from ourselves, doesn't He? He saves us from ourselves. I think that's what He did in my life. Oh my goodness. I... I, you couldn't live with me, I think, if, I, if Christ Jesus hadn't held, held on to me and grabbed hold of me. I would be so full of myself, full of pride, full of, I can do this and I can do that. And that's something the Lord still works on in me. But He grabbed hold of me. And He's grabbed hold of you. He's grabbed hold of you. And so my question to you, and I want us to look at some of the questions. Let's go to the, to the next one. I want us to consider some of these questions. So here's some questions. We could ask many more, but here's some questions to ask ourselves. And the first question is, am I living the life that God has called me to live? And that's a question for each one of us. I was praying last night and, and early this morning um, and in the car as I was coming, I was really praying, God, am I living the life you've called me to live? And it's a, it's, we, we can look at our lives and, and do a little bit, a little bit of evaluation Evaluation. Are you living the life God has called you to live? And that's not something I can answer for you because I don't know the full purposes for which Jesus has grabbed hold of you. Are you living? Now, some things I know, I can look at you, but there are a lot of things I don't know about your life. This is between you and God. Are you living the life that God has called you to live? And I was so, for myself, I was so challenged by that as I as I evaluated my own life. And you know, your pastors, both Pastor Renee and I, as we preach to you, I promise you, I promise you that what we preach to you, we have come before the Lord for ourselves as well, for ourselves. I promise you that. We don't get up. I, I promise you that we are not... Um, Try, we're not living hypocritical double lives, although the Lord is working on us. And sometimes what we pray to you is what we ourselves have not yet attained, but we're going in that direction. And, and for me, I had to look at my life and I, and I had to say, Lord, there are the main areas of my life. I am, I am living the life that you've called me to live. But Lord, in other areas of my life, I'm really wasting time. And I'm just speaking frankly, and maybe some of you would say the same thing. Lord, sometimes the, 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 my free time or my this or my that, Lord, I don't think, 
I am living the life that you've called me to live. I think your purposes for me are higher than some of the things I'm doing in my life. And you say, oh, are you sinning secretly, Pastor Jennifer? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But there are things that the Lord has for us that are higher than the things that we're involved in now, that are greater than the things that we're, that we're involved in now, that are more meaningful than the things we're involved in now, that are more eternal than the things that we're involved in now, that we're giving our lives to, that we're giving our times to, that we're giving our hearts to, that we're giving our attention to. God has, there's more. And why can I say that and not feel guilty and condemned? I can say that because Paul says this. Paul says this himself. Paul says, I don't, I haven't yet obtained it. I haven't reached it yet, but, but, and if Paul says that, Surely I can say that about my own life, and you can as well. And so, am I living the life God has called me to live? So that's one question for us to look at. What's the next one? The next one is, how do I live the life God has called me to live? And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And I can see right now, we may not make it all the way through, but we'll get there eventually. So, how do I live the life God has called me to live? As I was preparing... This, and the Bible tells us how, by the way. And we can look at other Christians who have lived the life, lives that God has called them to live. And the lives of other Christians can encourage us to live the life that God has called us to live. The life that God has called me to live, the reasons He took hold of me, are different from the reasons He took hold of you. Because you're an individual. He has given you gifts that He has not given me. He has given you talents that I don't have. He has, you're in a particular situation, I am not in that situation. And so when Jesus grabbed hold of you, He has purposes for you that He doesn't have for me. And He has some for me that He doesn't have for you. And so when I preach this, and when we look at this, does this mean, oh, if I'm living the life that God has called me to live, this means I must give up my business job. So Brother Kim, you must give up the work that you are doing now, and you must go into full-time ministry and live by faith, and, and I hope your wife and son and daughter can, they have to work, right? I hope they have enough, I hope they have enough to eat, but you know, is that what this means? No, this is not what this means, and that's not the point I'm trying to make this morning, but I think we're going to be looking at several different Christians this morning, including Paul, that will encourage us in this area. And one of the Christians that was on my heart is a, is a Scotsman, and um, some of you will know already, and his name is Eric Little. I don't know if any of you have heard of him before. I know Glenda and Amy have, right? And some of you have. And Kim and May are going, oh, like that. He's one of your heroes, right? He's one of my heroes, too. And I want to tell you a little bit about Eric Little. And you say, oh, are you preaching about a, a movie? No, I'm not preaching about a movie. But I do want to tell you about a movie. How many of you have seen the movie, many years old now, Chariots of Fire? Chariots of Fire. Wonderful. And you know what? Of all the movies that Hollywood makes, honestly, do you know that that movie is pretty close to fact? It's, it's pretty close to fact from, all, from the people who knew Eric Little and, and who knew the others. The facts are pretty, pretty straight. I want to tell you a little bit about Eric Little. He's one of the, in the, in the movie, he's one of the stars, but he's God's star in a bigger way. And I want to tell you a little bit about him as we consider these questions. Eric Little was from Scotland. And he went to his, he, but you may not have known this, but Eric Little uh, was born in, guess where? China. Do you know what city in China? He was born in Tianjin. It wasn't spelled that way. He was born in Tianjin. And he lived for five years in Tianjin. His parents were missionaries in China. Uh, in that area. And then in his schooling, he went back to Scotland. Uh, don't worry about that part. That's just the, where I, I got it from. This is a picture of him. He's from Scotland. He was a great, he went to university. He was a great student. He was a great athlete. So those of you that are students this morning, this, is, this one's for you. He, in, in inorganic chemistry, I think he got 94% or, or something, something like that. I mean, Inorganic chemistry, some of us are going, ah, right? Imagine, imagine. He was top academically, and you say, oh, well, I'm not that. Hang on, there's some others we're going to look at, too. He played rugby for his university, and apparently anybody that can really play rugby, I really admire, because it's, it's a tough sport, and was the top of it. But that's not the only thing. He was fast as well. He was fast. And I want us to look at this because this was a young man who was totally sold out to God, 
totally sold out to God. And when I asked you those questions, am I living the life God has called me to live and how do I live the life God has called me to live, I, was, I started thinking about Eric Little and I've read several books about him. By the way, don't let Chariots of Fire be your only introduction to Eric Little. Some of the books about him are so much more wonderful. But this is one of the things, it's in the movie, but this is one of the th things that in fact he did say and it's larger than that. So here he was really, really fast, loving the Lord, called to China, and there was a little bit of conflict with his sister, with, with others who were Christians, and they looked at him, and their idea for his life was, God has grabbed hold of you, you shouldn't be doing anything else, now you should go immediately and be a missionary. And sometimes we think things like that, don't we? God's call for you looks like this. Listen, God has grabbed hold of you, He will show you what your call, what His calling for you is. Don't let anybody put something on you. God gives you your calling. God grabs you. And so there was a little bit of friction. And he said, as he was serving the Lord and as he was running, because he ran in the Olympics that were held in Paris in 1924, and he won the gold medal for the 400 meter uh, race and others as well. He was faster in the 100 yard, but it was on, and some of those of you that have seen the movie know that, but it was part of it was on a Sunday and he refused to run on a Sunday. And so he stepped out of that and instead he ran in something else. But this is what he said. He said, I believe God made me for a purpose. Isn't that beautiful? I believe God made me for a purpose. He made him and then he grabbed him. But part of that was, but he also made me fast. That encourages me. And I'm not trying to preach what somebody else says because we're looking at the Word of God. But here's an example of what Paul is talking about that should encourage you as well. He says, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And then he says, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. I feel his pleasure. And he ran and he won the gold medal in the Olympics with glory and honor to God, with glory and honor to God. And so when we look at, oh, well, I have to go into full-time ministry if I'm going to fulfill the life God has called for me, that's not true. God has gifted us in many, many areas, many, many areas. And I believe these are gifts from God. And when we say, God, am I living the life you've called me to live? Paul would say, first of all, because he understood very well, Paul would say, God's highest purpose for you is to be made into the image of Jesus Christ. That's true. That's number one. That's number one. But then, how is that image of Christ displayed in the world? In one of the ways in Eric Little's life, it was using the gift that God had given. He says, God has made me fast. How has God made you? How has God made you? In your spiritual areas, but also in your non-spiritual areas. God made you in those ways. God gave you those gifts and those talents and those proclivities and those leanings. Use it for God. Serve God with it. Give glory to God in these areas, in all of these areas. If God has made you as you are, there is nothing in your life unless it's sin, unless it's sin, there's nothing in your life that you can say, oh, God, because I'm doing, I'm a businessman, because I'm a teacher, because I'm a helper, that's the part I do. And Lord, when I serve you, that's the part that you made me. No, I don't believe that. God has made us as we are. And like Eric Little, we can say, I believe, can you say that right now? I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me... Did he make you fast? <laughs> I tell you what, God did not make me fast. In high school, ch when we played softball together, I was, n I was always chosen last. Because you know what? I could hit the ball, but I was slow. I was so slow. And I'd always get out because I couldn't run faster than the ball. I'd always get out when I, when I ran to the base. I am so slow. But fill, it, fill in the blank for yourself. I believe God has made me for a purpose. But he also made me fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. How has God made you? How has God made you? Seriously. 
Do you have a talent for business? Do you have skills with people? Are you good with children? Are you good with baking, Christine? Or other things, or with hospitality, or, or all of these things. God has made you in those ways. And that is part of what Jesus has grabbed hold of. Are you using it for His glory? So am I living the life God has called me to live? And how do I live the life God has called me to live? And so I want us to look this morning as we continue. I, I hope this is, encourages you to go read about Eric Little. Oh, there's much, much more about his life. I was, I, was I was reading more about him yesterday, and I, just, I was so convicted. In fact, this weekend, part of what I was doing as I was preparing and as I was working in the house, part of the thing I was doing was sort of listening on YouTube and then reading, at times reading things, biographies of, of modern-day Christians, modern-day Christians who are living the life that God has called them to live. So, so encouraging. And so I want us to look at some things We've looked at Eric Little. I want us to look at some things that Paul says that will help us live the life that God has called us to live. So I want us to look at the first one. Let's go back, and I want us to look at the passage first so we can look at the next slide. And he says um, in, in uh, Philippians... Um, uh, let's, uh, sorry, let's go forward. Let's go forward beyond the Eric Little slide. Okay, next one. Okay, here we go. Let's leave it here just a minute. Okay, and I want us to look. We're going to look at five things. Okay, I hope we're going to look at five. <laughs> Maybe we'll look at two things. I don't know. But we'll get enough that we can be living the life God has called us to live. Here he says, I don't mean to say that I've already... Okay, uh, let's see. Let's not put that up until I say so. Okay? Let's take that. Thanks. Okay. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. And then in verse 13 he says, No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it or I've not yet to have taken hold of it. I've put NIV and New Living Translation here together. So here's, here's some things we can look at first. And so here are some of the things we can do that Paul does to live the life that God has called him to live, to fulfill the purposes for which Christ Jesus took hold of him. He says, I'm going to take hold of some things because he's taken hold of some things. And now we, can, now we can click that. What is the first one? And the first one is dissatisfaction. A dissatisfaction. You say dissatisfaction? Shouldn't we be? Didn't Paul say, I have learned to be content? Yes, he did. But as we look at this passage, what do we see? There is a holy a good dissatisfaction with his life, isn't he? He says, I haven't made it yet. I haven't made it yet. I think probably sometimes Christian leaders and leaders in the church and pastors, we are in most danger in this area, excuse me, we're in most danger in this area because we kind of feel like, well, I'm, I'm telling everybody else what to do. I sort of made it. But here's Paul, and there is in his life a dissatisfaction with where he is. It's not something that cripples him, it's not something that cripples him, because I talk with Christians, and Pastor Renee does as well, we sometimes talk with Christians who look at their own lives, and they're always condemning themselves, and they're always saying, I'm not good enough in this area, and I've failed in this area, and oh, and they're always living under a cloud of guilt. And I want to say something this morning, this is not what Paul is talking about. And that's not from God. That's not from God. Because what you see here, when Paul says, I haven't made it yet, it is not something that drags him down and is a cloud on him. Instead, it's almost as if, instead of being a burden on him, I'm not perfect yet and I haven't made it yet. Instead, it is a spur behind him and it is a goal in front of him. So instead of crippling him, it enables him. And there's a holy dissatisfaction. And he can say that because he really saw Jesus and he really understood why Christ Jesus had grabbed hold of him. That's why we want, that's one of the reasons we want to get to know Jesus better. That's one of the reasons we want to draw near in times of fellowship and in prayer. That's one of the times, that's one of the reasons we want to get into the Word of God because when we do, when we do, we begin to see, oh, Jesus, this is your goal for me. This is your plan for me. And when we see that, then it becomes real to us and we realize, oh, Jesus, this is what you want for me. This is what you want out of me. And I'm not there yet. And rather than being a condemnation that drags us down and that makes us feel like I'm unworthy, I'm unworthy, and I'm worthy, oh, we're all unworthy. 
but through Jesus we are made acceptable. And so because of that, we begin to see what Jesus has for us, and when we do, then in us, in us, there is a holy dissatisfaction. God, you want more from me, and I'm not there yet, so let me get going. Let me get going. That is one of the reasons I love to read Christian biographies. I really do. I love to, I love to talk with, with Christians that I, I re respect and admire. I love to ask them, I don't know about you, but I love to ask them questions about, tell me about your prayer life. How, when, when did you know that God called you? How did you develop this? I do. When I have the opportunity to be around Christians that have gone on down this road and that I respect and admire, I take them. I grab them. I want to be with them and I want to be near them. Why? Because I see something in their lives that stirs up my own life. And so number one, there should be a dissatisfaction with where we are. And that can only come, that can only come when we begin to see, oh, this is what you have for me, Jesus. This is what you want for me. And so here's a, I, I was listening and I want to go ahead and encourage you right now. I, I, I think I, I told Julie and I've told my sister as well. Um, I was on Friday, Friday evening, I happened to be looking at some things on YouTube and I looked at um, a, a sermon by Reinhard Bonnke, the German, uh, the great German evangelist. And some of you say, yes, but this, that, or whatever. You should go look at this on YouTube. Uh, it was, I think he preached it about a, sometime in this year. And the title of it was, God Uses Ordinary People. Oh my goodness. I was listening to that. I was so convicted. I know God has called me and I answered his call. Do you know what I did? I was crying. I started saying yes to God all over again. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Because I saw something in his life and the call of God that he's answered with such a full heart. So I encourage you to look that. Reinhard Bonnke, uh, God Uses Ordinary People. It's a little over an hour. Wow. So encouraging. So there should be a dissatisfaction with our lives. And that's one of the reasons I encourage you, get around really mature and godly Christians. Spend time with them. It will spur you on and encourage your life as well. So number one, dis dissatisfaction. What's the next one? Let's look at the next passage, okay? Let's look at this. So he says, I haven't reached it yet. I haven't achieved it yet. But look at this passage, and I've put it in bold so that we can see it. He says, I have not achieved it yet. I've not yet taken hold of it, but I focus on this one thing. Or in the NIV, it says, one thing I do. One thing I do. And I want us to think for just a minute about one thing. And I want to give us a word that will help us to remember this. By the way, I'm going to use words that begin with D. You say, well, that's not a D word in there. It's just to help us to remember. Okay? And the word is devotion. So here we have devotion. Our devotion, a single, a single-hearted thing. So we're going to talk about this for just a little bit. So the first one was a dissatisfaction, a holy dissatisfaction. The second one is a devotion, a devotion. Let me, give you, uh, l let me give you an example of that. Think of some people in this church. Uh, can you think of one couple in this church where the husband is really, 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 really devoted to his wife? I can think of somebody right now. He's not here right now. They'll be here in the second service. Can you think of who it is? He's tall and she's short, right? Who is it, May? Steve. Now, Brother Kim, I know you're devoted to your wife, May. <laughs> and, and Pastor Renee, I know you're devoted to your wife, Bridget. But when I was thinking about this yesterday, I was thinking of Steve and Rose. Steve is so devoted to Rose. So devoted to Rose. If you've ever gone out to eat with them while they're sitting there, you know what? You'll look, I'll look over there, and you know what Steve will do? He'll reach over and he'll grab her hand, <laughs> whether she wants to or not. <laughs> he'll grab her hand, and he'll look at her, and you could, he, he esteems her. He's devoted to her. And it's a, it's a single, there's a focus, there's a gaze. And that, I was thinking of that as, as I was thinking about this devotion. Um, it, it's a singleness of purpose and a singleness of gaze. I want us to look very quickly at a few other verses in the Bible that talk about one thing, and I think it'll help us to understand a little bit better. Let's look at the next, let's look at the next one. So one thing, and we're going to do this very, very quickly. Look at Mark 10, 21. The rich young ruler had come to Jesus, and he says, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, and I've done this. 
And you know what Jesus says? He looks deep into his heart and he says, one thing you lack. And he puts his finger. It's one thing. It's the main thing. And as we look at these verses, it helps us to understand this, this thought of one thing. So the first verse is, one thing you're missing. Look at Luke 10, 41 through 42. This was Mary and Martha. We know this one so well, right? Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him. Martha's running around cooking for the crowd, for the house full of guests. Somebody's got to cook for them. Somebody's got to clean for them. Martha's mad because Mary's not doing it and she's doing it all herself. And she goes to Jesus. Wow, that's a big complaint, isn't it? And she goes fussing to Jesus. Jesus is busy telling people about God. And she goes to him and says, you tell my sister, whatever. And in love, Jesus looks at her and what does he say? Only one thing is needed. Only one thing is needed. Mar Mary has chosen what is better. That gives us a better idea of one thing, right? Only one thing is needed. And it's this beautiful picture of, of intentness and priority and supremacy. Look at the next one, John 9, 25. This is when Jesus healed a man who was blind and the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, called him and they said, Who is this man? Who did this to you? Um, what is he like? And what did he say? And they're asking him all these questions. <coughs> Look at what the man says. He replied, Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know. One thing I do know. I was blind, but now I see. There were all these questions, but the man knew there's only one thing that's really important. The most important thing was, one thing I know. I was blind, and now I see. One thing. And then in Psalm 27.4, this is a Psalm of David, and what does he say? One thing I ask of the Lord, and this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. And here's this beautiful picture, Psalm 24, 7. Psalm 24, 7. David did many things with his life, didn't he? Did, he was a, a shepherd. He was a soldier. He was a king. He was a singer. He was a writer. And yet a musician. And yet he says one thing. So what does that tell us about, what does that tell us about one thing? And we go back, go, we can go on to the next slide. What does that tell us? One thing. As we look, we go to the next slide, devotion. As we look at devotion, one thing. It's about priority, I think. It's about priority. Instead of there's this, 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 and this, can you only do, is there anyone who can only do one thing in his or her life? Only one thing, anybody? No! Of course not. We're all multitasking. So what does this mean? What does this mean? What it means is, what it means is there's a priority. Everything else is less important when it comes to the one thing. Do you want to live the life that God has called you to live? Then there must be a devotion. There must be a one thing in your life and everything else has to fit with it. You say, but can I do that if I'm a student in school? Yes, you can. There's a one thing in God and then everything else falls into place. Can you do that if you clean houses all day long and take care of disobedient children and try to make every sure? Can you do that? Yes, you can. There's a one thing. My eyes are on you, Lord. And then everything else that comes along behind. Everything else fits, it, fits with it. Can you do that if you're a teacher? Sure. There's a one thing. There's a one thing. Do you know that Paul in his life, he was not always a full-time pastor or evangelist or preacher. Do you know that? If you will read the New Testament letters, you will see that part of the time Paul was working in a secular job. You say, he was? Yes. Go back. You can read it in his letters and you can read it in the book of Acts. What was Paul doing in his secular job? What was he doing? He was making tents. You know what I think? Knowing Paul as we do, I'll bet you Paul's tents were A number one. Don't you think so? Have you ever thought, I thought about that this morning. I thought, I'll bet, your, I'll bet Paul's tents were top of the line. I'll bet they were great. Why? Why? 
because he had a one thing mentality. He had a one thing mentality and everything else in his life fit with that. Everything else in his life was influenced by, by that. So I want to say something to you because there are quite a few of their students in here this morning, quite a few of your students. As a student, you have pressures that are unbelievable. You have pressures that are as great as the business people in here, as, as others as well. And sometimes the pressures of what you do of your schoolwork and of university and all of these things seem to take over. I encourage you, keep a one thing in your life. Keep, I want to know Christ. I press on to take hold of that for which He took hold of me in your life and all of the things in your school and in your classroom and all that you do, it will fall into place. It will fall into place. Does it mean that it will be easy peasy? No, it doesn't mean that. You will work hard. You'll have to work hard. It may not always be exactly what you'd want to, but if you will have a one thing mentality, a devotion, devotion, all of these other things will fall into place. You know, I, I really believe that. You know, we looked at Eric Little just a minute ago uh, we're not going to get through the five D's, by the way, as I look at the time, but that's okay. I was thinking about Eric Little, and I, I think, you know, he won the Olympics. He won, he won the gold medal in the 400 meter. And um, we may not get any further than this this morning as we think about devotion. But here's this, this man. Um, here's this man that, that loved God with all of his heart and was also really, really fast. Do you know uh, he won the Olympics, the Paris Olympics, he won the 400 meters, but that was not his best sport. Did you know that? He was actually the best in the 100 yard dash. That was his best sport, absolutely his best. And then he found out that it was on a Sunday and he refused to run on a Sunday. He refused to run. Do you know that the British Olympic Committee came to him and pressed him to run because he was their best chance for gold. He was their best chance and he refused to run. And actually it was a few months before when he found out when it would be. It wasn't the day of or a few days before. So you know what he started doing? He was best in the 100 yard dash. But he started running and pre preparing a, just a few months before for the 400 meters. For the 400 meters. And he ran in that race instead. That wasn't even his specialty. Do you know what? The British Olympic Committee did not even want him to run in the 400 meters because they said, your times in practice are not good enough. You will certainly be defeated. We have no chance if you run in the 400 meters. But that's what he did. And he won. And he broke a world record when he ran. Did you know that? He broke a world record in the 400 meters. And I'm not preaching Eric Little, but here's an example when we talk about devotion. Because he refused to compromise his devotion, yeah? His devotion. God, you are first. God, you are first in my life. The Lord took care of the other parts of his life that he had also made, that he'd also made. Those of you who are students and you're studying this and that, God has made those parts of you. He's made you in those areas. You want to excel in those areas? Have a devotion. Have a one thing in your heart and life. And this message is not just for students this morning, it's for every one of us. It's for every one of us. Because when we have a devotion, when our goal is it's a one thing in our lives, everything else will fall into place. And we will live the lives that God has called us to live. We will fulfill that. We will take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of us. Amen? Amen. 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 So he says, I haven't achieved it already. I haven't reached perfection. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. You need to get with Jesus and you need to get with God and get close with Him to find out for what reason He took hold of you. Surely it's to make you like Jesus. That's number one. That's number one. But He has made you spirit, soul, and body. Every part and every part can bring glory to God. 
bring glory to God with all that you are, with all that you have, with all that you will be. A one thing devotion. I press on and I focus. And I press towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. When we come back to this again, we're going to look at three more things. The first one is dissatisfaction, a spiritual, a holy dissatisfaction that spurs us onward. The second one is devotion. One thing. I think some of us are so busy, even working for the Lord, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, that we're not getting the one thing, the one thing. And when there is one thing, that is when in our spiritual lives we will flourish and we will be as productive as He has for us to be. We press towards the goal for the prize of the calling, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, heavenward. Let's close in prayer. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you for our brother Paul.